Welcome to our ComposeCast, where we discuss productivity, self-hosting, career professionalism, and innovative technology. Here to bring you the latest from the open source ecosystem and beyond is yours truly, Andrew Syriac, and with me is my co-host, Jack Moore. How are you doing today, Jack? I am doing well over here. I'm doing pretty good. Our dev site does not ap- appear to be doing the same. I- I'm going to ask, how are you doing over there? I will be better once I fix it after the show, but that's not relevant. I can work off the markdown file, uh, which is eminently readable thanks to its beautiful spec. Um, but besides <laughs> that, we will... <laughs> Uh, if you if you bear with me, I'll, I'll get it up and ready uh, as soon as possible. Yeah, we have no, oddly enough, no intro items this week. We do have a lot of developments and we do have uh, quite a few community updates uh, that I found somewhat entertaining this week. Uh, I'll, I'll just jump right into them. Uh, the first one, kind of a small one here, uh, Firefly 5.6.5 was released. Really nothing huge uh, going on. It's just quite a few bug bug fixes that were going on uh and then he's it looks like uh they're continuing to develop on ldap which was integrated recently uh so in the 5.6.5 notes release notes uh he just kind of covers that uh there was one issue i found kind of funny which was uh issue 5245 Uh, i don't know if you have it right in front of you it's quote fix various weirdly formatted amounts and if you open up the issue it shows basically in the budget uh someone's trying to create an amount and what's showing up is 300 comma and then about 25 zeros (laughs) immediately after so i don't know who's counting down to that many decimals maybe tracking in bitcoin or some kind of coin who who knows but uh that one was a fun one um other than that nothing major on that release now we did have some other big project updates with dollar bar uh jumping into their 15 beta which if i'm not going to go through this entire list there is i want to say 50 items Mm. that have been updated uh the most notable uh i guess addition or removal is that you know that your favorite service there the point of sale a module that you can add in for point of sale systems. That module, unfortunately, the simple point of sale module has been completely removed. Uh, they now they now have, I guess, a new one which is called Take POS Take Point of Sale, uh, which is used. But uh, you can go through and look. There's an entire huge list out there. With these, what I loved with this one was they have this freeze definition. So, moving to 15 beta, it looks like they have, I don't know how what their architecture looks like, but basically they go into these maintenance stages and uh, freeze stages, and they're in a, at a freeze stage right now. So, basically, the only additions that developers can contribute are essentially bug fixes. And I'm going to pull up the notes here on what it is when we i'm going to read it here when we make a freeze of code it means we start the beta period it does not mean that we must not change code it means that we can do the same thing it means that we can do something it means that we can do something and we can't for some other poorly worded but okay uh, i'm pretty sure <laughs> laurent is french um, okay so that that would that would explain that, that. makes sense yes. that makes a little yeah. broken english poor english there uh but it basically goes into what the freeze looks like and i found this very interesting because i had not thought about this basically it blocks any kind of architectural change if you want any kind of architecture change you're basically not allowed once this thing hits beta the only changes that are allowed are fixes style changes and updates to i think it was language uh translate and when i say language translation so they have that freeze definition out there and then they have a maintenance basically once it gets out of beta it goes into maintenance and that's really just bug fixes all around but awesome to see that dollar bar is moving from 14 to a 15 beta here Uh, i'm excited to see that uh and don't know if you have any anything you want to comment on that one or Anything to add with that? It's it's very easy to see a large number and and think, oh, development, you know, must be, must be going really really well. 
Um, and, and actually, that's the exact tact that Firefox took when they switched their versioning from their like 3.x series and within six months they were at 12 six months later they were at like 36 i was like what, what why hang on why yeah. do you do this um so it's good to see that the numbers mean something to them uh right especially with that freeze definition so you can uh, get a a concept of, of what's going in there um and and they do have it laid out here pretty well so super happy to see that 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 is indication to me of a healthy ecosystem it's a growing pro. It's absolutely. It's a growing project. Uh, I think skipping ahead here to another growing project. I'm going to skip right ahead to Sweet CRM eight, and this is another one. Another update. Sweet CRM eight is quote here, and I love this because when they last posted about eight, it was 2018, and they start off this post with, after many months in the making many months not wrong we are ex- not inaccurate <laughs> we're excited to share with you the most advanced and sophisticated upgrade to date uh one that promises to give you even better control of your data and business solutions and they kind of go into this whole covid pandemic spout and just kind of it was more a pr post than it was uh release notes yeah it magnified but the I, need I, for our enhanced crm capabilities as online marketplaces became saturated they say with new companies and consumer demands shifted at breakneck speeds okay so that that's great but if you go back to their post saying new user interface in suite 8 <laughs> suite crm 8 basically this is why it took them 30 months uh <laughs> they did a complete rewrite of their ui <laughs> They went through and they rewrote everything, I believe, in Angular mm. uh, with an API first development approach. So after many months, there is there is your reason why it took many months. Um, I, I thought that one was kind of fun. They, I guess they switched to Angular 6. And honestly, we were on 7. I was looking at the pictures of 8 and it does look better. I remember opening up Sweet CRM and I, I didn't hate it. I didn't dislike it, but man, it was it was a little clunky. It felt a little clunky. The UI felt a little clunky to me. So I'm excited to see what eight has to offer. Um and that brings us to our last one here. And last update. Dan Brown releasing twenty one dot eleven. Uh and with this we have more security releases, uh, some API changes. There are some features. There's an upload limit. But really, most notably, is the two features that were added were, were tags. And I, I don't mean to say that it was added. It's been there. But it's a better way to list how tags are in Bookstack uh, and a better view for all the tags. Yeah, but a, a then, better way to, to find tags and, and view all the tags that are right. available to you and say, all right, I was, how did I start categorizing these things again and, and being able to kind of get a high level overview of those tags? That, and that's helpful, honestly. I Being able to look at the tags and go, well, that means, I, I break it down back to us, right? It's, all right, these are all tagged with, let's just say upstream project. Basically, we can tag all of those chapters with that tag and basically say, all right, I want to find every upstream project. This is where I can go to immediately find this rather than clicking through each book and finding each exactly upstream project link. Yeah. Uh, so definitely something beneficial. Uh, the next one here was the search system enhan- the search system enhancement, which I, I don't know if you saw this one. Um Basically, it changes the way they're displayed, and it really just looks like it. the word that you search is bolded now. So the functionality is there. The search is there. That's great. That's awesome. Uh, it's just a little UI tweak, it looked like. Uh, and then it also, there was an API edition for search as well that's out there. So awesome to see that that project is still continuing to be worked on. Seems like a great ecosystem as well. Um but those are the major. That's all the community news I had. Uh, there was, there wasn't anything else going on. No, no run deck updates or releases. So, 
that is all I have for the community updates. Now, I know we have some of our own developments here, quite a few, actually. I think, uh, do you want to jump into those? I know we have quite a few. Yeah, and and really, this is why I titled the episode Every Dev Has Their Day, because mine was sometime last week where I just started to dive into some of these features. And, uh, and it's ones that I have been throwing around in my head for quite a while, uh, trying to figure out, you know, where do I want to take the project and and, and really uh, how can we take the next step uh, into something that is functional, something that's resilient, um, something that is featureful. Uh, so I, I, I took uh, a couple major uh, parts of these and 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 kind of did some rearranging uh, and and I think that speaks to you know at least my understanding of the project you look at what sweet CRM did right they were able to take their entire front end and and um, since they had done a good enough job with it previously they were able to to refactor it really is is what it came down to and and uh, there's not a whole lot here that's not refactoring um, that enables other functionality which also got put in there right and and that's that's really the the advantage of any kind of refactoring as as i'm i'm fond of saying there's not there's not tech debt when you're not actively paying it off or it's not actively accruing right um however it is good to plan on that because you're able to say all right it's still well written therefore when i need to refactor it it will be that much easier uh, and and I was actually just surprised how easy it was for for instance the first thing I did was split up the services into roles and that is really taking advantage of Ansible's new collections feature uh, when I first wrote um, the compositional role it was simply a role there were there were no collections right we we migrated to collections on the 3.0 series 3.x series and from then on we have been working basically as a role that happened to be in a collection. Um, this shifts that on its head and says, we are taking advantage and using this collection as a bona fide collection. Uh, we, it's a collection of roles. It has playbooks. You know, we have the possibility of creating our own custom modules and throwing those in there. Uh, so there is, there is a lot that is now available to us with this rewrite. Um, especially that now enables us to start implementing present stopped and absent states of services, which is um, not to spill the beans, but it's it's basically the, the biggest step forward that, that we're going to take probably in the next six months, if not year, uh, because that's going to enable a lot of stuff in the front end, a lot more management via portal uh, of the services right. that are running on your instance. Uh, so I, I know Jack's looking at me like that's going to be a lot of work on my end, but you know, it, it's, it's going to be good. It's, it's good for us to be able to provide this functionality in a sane type of a way. And, and by sane type of a way, I mean the ability to modularize stuff. For instance, all the checking of the Maria DB container, right? If it was instantiated or not, uh, has been farmed out to the MariaDB role. Same with the bind mount points; those have been um, those have been split out into its its own uh, role, which is called by every container which uses bind mount points. Um, and you know, a, a couple different um, updates there. Now, specifically, port portal is obviously going to be a special case. Um, I, I like to try not to treat it as such, if at all possible, because it should just fit into the paradigm. But it really is what allows for all the functionality here. Uh, and as so, there is a part in which it sets up the socket that it runs on. Uh, so that it, 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 it sounds very recursive the way that it needs to call and set itself up um, if it's doing maintenance on itself. So like handling that um, was was something I, I dove into because I was like, you know, I, we want this to be self-hostable, right? We want this to be infrastructure agnostic. You know, it can't be dependent and it has to be independent of our infrastructure. So how do, how do we make that happen? Uh, and a lot of that revolved around commands receivable, which got a lot of love. Um, specifically moving to uh, branch branches of the project 
whereas before we were simply cloning down the master uh, of, of the, the project. So all of the playbooks, um, all of the scripts were all master. Now it's separated into stable major versions, so stable 3, stable 4, um, as we work on the stable 3.x series and the stable 4.x series. Um, the thought is since a major version would break backwards compatibility, um, anything that is in any of those major versions in the collection should be able to be ran by the same uh, project branch. So, so stable four should be able to run any stable four dot X series. Um, and, and just a lot of scripting around that. Um, and a lot of cleanup. Uh, I, I noticed that we were leaving Docker containers around as we were building them to run commands receivable that was taking up space on disk. So we would definitely want to minimize that they now remove themselves. Um, one of the other th interesting things is that when we're running playbooks, we were running it on localhost comma as the inventory file, which is just the local host. Um, however, that does not pull in the group bars for the rest of the play. So now we are echoing the local host into an actual inventory file and running it from that inventory file. Uh, this now allows us to pick up the group bars directory that is inside of the environment directory. Um, and then a lot of hacks around that environment directory too. Not, not hacks, but a lot of using it inside of portals ecosystem and on the host as well. Uh, so there's, there's a lot where that duality is being used, um, where, where, where the same file is accessible via the host or via the Docker container. Um, a couple of things specific to accounting. Um, so, so to jump in, uh, Jack helped me out with accounting. So, uh, I'm just going back and cleaning up a couple of the, the things here. I'm being a little bit nitpicky, but you know, let me, you know, it's, it's my baby. So okay. I, can, I can do what okay. I want. Um, okay. accounting does have a built-in setup, which we had called previously as an additional task. Um, the problem with that, and, and this kind of all stemmed from me putting volumes in poor in, in accounting and that that broke a lot of a lot of stuff because didn't like that well no it didn't because when you bind mount something onto a container it overwrites that directory inside of the container and then it's up to the entry point to resolve that and a lot of php apps will in the container it will install it into user local source or just user source and then rsync that entire directory over to like var ww html like where where your regular web server would be looking for accounting doesn't do that uh it just sits everything there and pre-populates the modules directory so when i mounted the bind mount point onto the modules directory it overwrote the modules it directory and refused to build because the modules that it needed weren't there the fix uh, I ended up doing because I, I'm not, I, I submitted an issue to upstream. So I'm waiting on upstream to, to work around that, which is the correct way to do it. In the meanwhile, what we're doing is we are spinning up a temporary container, copying those files into the, the bind mounts um, before we build the container. So it's, it's an additional spin up of a container, but that takes, you know, under a second so i'm not i'm yeah. not concerned about the the actual time that takes and it's item potent too so we should be fine on that front um and then the only other thing i noticed with accounting is it didn't have any help checks so i wanted to go in and run those and those were failing which is kind of what led to me finding all the rest of this other stuff um and then talking about specific other uh features of the instance uh Portal and Command Center. Um, actually, Jack, I'll let you talk about uh, Portal and Command Center here. Sure. Yeah. So, long story short, we were running into timeouts on the deploys for Portal and Command Center, and this was what this would cause minute delays, a couple minutes. Oh, like five delaying. minutes. Yeah, I think yeah, we have. It, it, yeah. I think what Portal, both the Ruby applications were they would wait for a full timeout before starting essentially. So it was three, three or five minutes yeah. where the instance was just waiting on these services to spin up and it would essentially wait for the timeout to happen. And so specifically it was waiting for them to shut down because it would send the, it would send the signal to kill the process, but 
the process had already forked off the command and was no longer there so until the container got force killed which was the parent of the parent uh it was just sitting there it would just run yeah because what we had we had the full-on in it system already in there uh, on the initial deploy like on the initial what what the docker file was configured for what the um how the process was, how the container was spun up. Basically, it would run Bash, and then Bash would fork and run the Puma, the web server. So when we wanted to kill one of these applications from the container, it would what ki- run a. Uh, it would try to kill a process. That it, it would try no to kill the process. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that's where we. That's where the timeout occurred. So we put in a fix. Uh, I don't think it was te- uh, now that I think about this I don't know if we tested it on an instance or maybe we did oh, test it on an it. instance. I for sure tested it. It was yeah. tested, but essentially what we started to notice with health checks was that nothing was cleaning up processes. Yeah, I would, as I health would checks run a, were running. I would run a PS on the server and I would see hundreds of these SSL client zombie processes. And I saw that and I was like, oh, that's going to be a bad day. That sounds like future Andrew's problem. So I shut my laptop and walked away. <laughs> of course. So we come to realize <laughs> Bumble does not clean up zombie processes and processes as an init system do. What system D in it, what is it, in it that the, uh, it was bundle doesn't clean these up. It's just a Ruby process. It just runs the web server. It runs it and it just says, I'm happy, whatever. I'll leave all these other processes to do whatever they want. It didn't clean them up. So what we had to do, we had to go in to our, it was a nice fix. It was actually a quick fix. Uh, in the Docker compose file, we just said there's a, a neat little uh, init parameter. Flat. I don't know if you want to call it a flat. Yeah, parameter basically saying, uh, do you want it? It's an init parameter. I don't know if that just means it includes bash in there or includes an init system in the container. It does. What that looks uh, like. So there's an init system called tiny T I N I. And that is the init system that calls the command. I don't know if it calls the entry point as well, uh, but that is the, the init process that is run. And long story short, that, that started cleaning up all of our zombie processes, and next thing we know, we are up and running the yeah. zombie processes. Yeah, so it took us uh, two hops, but, you know, we got there eventually. We, I was going to say, I was going to say, we uh, made you, it. You you did have a nice write-up here about that, too. So we, we do have that on our new Compositional Enterprises blog, uh, so that is under there. Um, I also tried to sh- split up the show notes into instance features, service resiliency, engagement, and administrative. Uh, Jack, you're probably going to recognize this. Um, Everyone at home may not. Uh, This is how we split up our Q4 goals. So uh, this is kind of keeping us accountable as to, you know, of our overall kind of pillars or what you want to call them uh, for Q4, how we're, what, what are the developments lead, leading towards? Like, where where do we classify right. them? What are, what are we spending our time on? So, um, part of the service that would that all being under the instance features category, uh, what we've done in the service resiliency category is uh, split up our projects into stable three and stable four. I touched on that earlier. Um, CSCD had to be fixed uh, because we're no longer building off of straight master. There's a lot more logic that had to go into those those scripts. Um, we were able to pull up new playbooks that enabled no impact restart of services, or at least no impact to Minimal. any other services. Yeah. yeah. When we're doing um, a restart of a service, it doesn't bring the whole instance down. It only blips that one service, and then we're back up and running. Uh, and then lastly, which is a huge thing unto, unto, which is a huge thing unto itself is the secure remote callback support. That is something that I had experimented with. Taking a look at the blog post, it was like five years ago. Uh, you know, and, and it's like, how do you use a publicly accessible jump post to 
troubleshoot someone else's computer no matter where they are, right? And the steps to do that, um, you know, there, there's plenty of ways to do that now. Um, you can use um, WireGuard VPNs, you know, you can use other tunneling type systems. Uh, I just chose to use good old SSH because it's it's very simple and straightforward. Um, the, the, there was there was some kind of cool ways that we used uh, key generation and different di <laughs> just different bashisms. The way the way we were getting around uh, limitations in in how we want to keep things secret, but also provide access really to, to anyone who, who needs it. Um, what, what we're hoping for in the, the future is, you know, if, if someone's maybe not on our infrastructure, but needs some support, right. Could that be something uh, that we would be able to provide them in a secure type manner? And I believe this would be something uh, that would implement that. Yeah, that's awesome. That's an exciting one. I, I'm gonna have to look. I, I saw your post from a while back. I didn't know. I don't know if you're using. Is it a? Is it a? Are you using a service or do you just expose SSH? Do you just open it up? So, so there's, and I'm not gonna go into this today because we're we're running short on time. But there is a service that I've added. So like right next to accounting or portal, uh, there's another service that I just entitled callback uh, that exposes itself publicly uh, i believe it was on port 9022 uh, and then it has a user in it um customizable username that gets started in a restricted shell and it can only run various custom scripts that are pre-approved that are in that image and it's it's odd because this is the exact same paradigm that we've used for commands receivable wherein we are whitelisting commands the commands that yeah. can be ran and it seems like this type of paradigm continues to reinforce itself as a very scalable type solution uh, to to problems like these uh, where we don't necessarily want to expose anything but a limited amount of processes that's awesome i i think of speaking of processes here processes nodes commands activity you must be talking our, about run deck I, I that i am well i can talk on that today um, as I have put together uh, the show notes, I slaved away uh, over them over the past uh, couple of hours here. So uh, more than happy to, to present on these. Now, I will preface a lot of this with saying um, we are going over the application interface here. This is not going to be as as in-depth right especially on a podcast you know even a, even a video podcast like this this, this is just not the medium uh, to to really get our hands into this um, I am still as I as I uh, have in the past and will continue to do uh, am going to be going over how we're using this right our experiences with this how we found this to be what has been useful to us. And today we're going over the activity uh, as well as the nodes and commands section of this. Um, so it, the the breakup of this is, is somewhat arbitrary, um, simply that the activity I'm going to be able to speak a little bit more on the nodes and the commands. There's not a whole lot to to dig into. Uh, so to, to start with the activity, um, I, of course, link to the docs uh, right off the bat. Um, they, they are community curated, right? I mean, this is, this is the canonical place to go and search for, uh, features that are available, uh, for ways to do things and, and just kind of to get a sense of, of what's available to you, uh, to plagiarize their introductory introduction to activity though, uh, they start with, uh, execution history for commands and jobs is stored by the Rundex server. 
execution history can be filtered and viewed inside the activity page. So this is the page that you would go to to review any jobs that have been ran. Um, of course, with any kind of automation front end, you're going to be running jobs. And these jobs are going to have output and they're going to have results. Um, they're also going to have parameters and, you know, you might want to keep a history of how well they've been doing and, you know, um, how successful they've been doing. And Rundeck does this. Uh, this. This is what the activities page is all about. So it's going to show you the jobs that it had ran and by default, it just spits out all of them. Uh, so previously when we were talking on cleaning up the executions, uh, this is what we were talking about limiting. Um, and I took a screenshot directly from our instance and I did manage to capture it here. The one, the, the, the run, uh, the second actual running process here is one, two, three, four, five, six. So to give you, to give you an idea of how many jobs we run, that is an integer. That is not simply me counting. So that's a uh, job 123,456. That's quite a few jobs. That's, that's a good, decent amount of jobs. Um, that is starting when we ran all of our health checks every five minutes from this, the CNC machine though. So I would expect it to be quite large. However, we're not keeping all of those logs. Like we, we talked about before. I mean, it's 60 days, I believe that we're, we're keeping, um, or 90 days. I forget. Uh, either way, we're, we're not storing all the way back to the beginning of time here. However, the ones that we do store are going to be available to us through this interface. And I point out a couple things in this interface, just real simple things. Um, I have, I have uh, three kind of bullet points here, and these are the things really that I look at um, when I'm looking through my jobs. The first thing here is what are the running jobs? So yes, it does actually show you the running jobs in addition to the completed jobs. Uh, so it will, <clears throat> it will show you uh, the percentage uh, completion based on previous executions. Uh, it'll show you the date and time. Uh, it'll show you which job is running and along with the parameters uh, that it ran with and what user ran the job. Uh, it also shows you the status of the job. So besides the running jobs, uh, the completed jobs will report as either successful, uh, marked by a green check mark and a OK text like a, like a one okay, which is the number of nodes. Um, but for us, there's always going to be one. Just um, one or a failed job, which is marked with a red dash and a one failed text. Um, so those, uh, completed jobs, there's also, um, stopped jobs, I, I, I guess, um, I, I, I left out there, but really the only ones that I'm concerned about are, are going to be the succeeded or the failed jobs. Um, note that the currently running jobs do need to be refreshed to get the latest update on this page um, or the auto refresh box in the top right hand corner selected. Uh, and this kind of brings us back to our run deck is an interface on top of an API um, instead of automatically refreshing or, you know, providing a socket type feedback system. It's just going to want to pull the API to see where the job is at, much like uh, Jack actually already does uh, with his scripting in Portal. Um, and then, you know, what what do these actually do? Well, well, these are simply entries in a list, uh, and selecting any one of them will take you to their log outputs, where you can review the output, any any details, and and um, everything else about them. Like for instance, this doesn't exactly say here uh, in the summary how long it took. If you wanted to find that out, you would want to go into the details page um, and, and much, much more is available in there as well. The other note I have on activity is uh, regarding searching for prior executions. So searching, I say here, is most successful when using the name field to search the name of the job you would like to find. The rest of the filters likely aren't going to be of much help. Uh, from there, you can look through the job executions to find the one you were looking for. Typically, that's going to be one that's recent. Uh, something that springs to mind for me is looking for different 
uh, environment creation runs, right? Because every time we create an environment, um, if we're just doing a temporary throwaway, we let run deck and the script that creates it for us create the vault password for us. We don't we don't rely on ourselves to come up with a random vault password. So we we let it create those for us, and then we use those subsequently uh, to to do any kind of testing variable manipulation that we need. When I'm going to find those. Um, I will look for any create new environment runs, and then I will look at all those that are sorted um, chronologically with the newest being on top and find the one I'm looking for by looking at the parameters. Now you would think, hey, Andrew, why not just search for the parameter? Well, there's no field to do that. Um, and and I, do, I do point that out in the documentation here. There's currently no way to search by options um, or the variables that are passed to the execution. Uh, but they are displayed on the front, which makes it easier than it would have been if I would have had to gone through each of the pages in detail manually. Uh, now, there is something I didn't put in the documentation because I wasn't exactly sure how to say this succinctly. However, when you go to run a job, like if you if you're at that tree view, the main the main jobs view, and you go into a job at the very bottom, there's going to be a tab uh, that says activity, and that's basically a predefined filter for all of the activity of that job. So it's it's basically doing the exact same thing, which is why I kind of left it off the documentation. I just want to say, hey, just just if you're if you're brand new to this, you haven't discovered that yet, that's fine. Just go to the activity section and find it there. Um, but if you are, um, say, if I ran five different, you know, RCR runs and I'm looking back and, and I was like, oh, yeah, the one two runs ago failed or whatever. And I'm still on that page. I know that at the very bottom, I can just pull up that activity and go right to the one that I ran uh, two times ago. So and that's where I find it the most valuable, honestly, is under activity for the actual job itself. I, I have not looked under. Uh, is there a default activity page that shows everything? Yeah, it's right under and, the job section on the left hand side of you. So I have not used that. I do not use that. I actually go specifically to the job and then I look at the activity pane under that specific job. So when you mentioned, you know, run compositional role, that's that's a bad example. When you run, create new environment is the one I automatically go to because I'm like, all right, well, we just created the environment. What's the password? I know I created it. Uh, I usually end up scrolling over. I, I know we have the podcast for showing graphs, pictures, but basically we're able to look at the parameters and say, all right, what, what environment is this? What throwaway environment is this? Oh, it's this one. And I'm able to click on it and go, okay, that's where the password that was generated is. That's where I, that's where I usually go. I tend to go directly underneath the jobs. Yeah. So, and, and, uh, like I said, this is an API driven, uh, application web, web application. So if you're able to make those, uh, linkages, you know, intelligent like that, there's no reason not to just take advantage of that. So I'm, I'm all for that. Uh, hopping over to nodes and commands then, um, once again, I'm, I'm linking to the documentation here and, and, and especially because these aren't something that I've really had call to use per se. Uh, it's helped uh, sometimes in, in testing, uh, just being able to, to get down to the, the bottom of things. But I would definitely go to the documentation, right? If, if you're going to get started on these, first of all, there's so many different ways to connect to different nodes. Um, because not only is it, you know, a server, but it's a, an executable on a server. Uh, so, you know, it's going to be uh, a WinRM connection to a Windows jump host, or it's going to be an SS, SCP SSH connection to a, a Linux jump host, or, you know, may, maybe even network devices or uh, Kubernetes, you know, and, and this could be, this could be one of any different number of things. Uh, and this is where Rundex extensibility is not a place that we've touched yet. Um, and, and nor have we really had a need to, but to go over our understanding of nodes and commands, uh, a node, um, I am also going to steal from their documentation, is a resource that is either a physical or virtual instance of a network accessible host. 
Nodes have a few basic attributes, but a node's attributes can be extended to include arbitrary named key value pairs. Attributes typically describe the property of a node or reflect the state of the node. One of a node's built-in attributes is called tags, which is a list of classifications or categories about that node. Um, so we should see that RunDAC by default is meant to contact all of the nodes independently, as opposed to how we're running it as a simple front end onto the CLI. Uh, that being the case, however, we do know a couple of tricks on how to do that efficiently. For instance, uh, in order to get a listing of all nodes, which by default, it shows none of them. It doesn't show all of them, it shows none of them. So to get all of them, you would place a dot asterisk into the filter on the top, that being the common regex for any character repeating. So it's, it's literally, show me everything that matches the pattern that matches everything. Uh, and then in the Docker container, um, to, to kind of expand on how we use it, in the Docker container, Rundeck will always list itself as a node. And the executable directory is the home directory of the user that runs the Rundeck service. In Docker's case, the Rundeck user. So when I go into the container to troubleshoot something and I want to find where Rundeck has, has executed something or, or where a temporary directory has been set up, um, if it's anything that's not marked in an absolute path, it's going to be relative to the home user's directory. So that's why it's important to know that it's going to be the home run deck uh, directory. Uh, and then node actions here, I think from the documentation was always, was also interesting to me. Um, the node actions menu contains links to run a command, um, which choosing that item will forward your browser to the commands page or to create a job. Choosing this menu item will forward you to the job create page um, and enter the filter expression in the edit form. So by default, we include all nodes available. Um, but if you have a filter instead of dot asterisk that you would like uh, to either run a specific command on or create a job off of, uh, then you can do that straight from that filter that you just carefully crafted to get the exact nodes that you wanted. Um, and, and speaking of running a command, uh, the, the last thing here for us to go over uh, are those commands. Um, so what is a command? Well, it is literally exactly what you would think it is. So a command is a single executable string executed on a node. Rundeck invokes commands on nodes via a node executor, which evaluates the command string and executes it. Executors. Node executors evaluate the command string in a data context containing information about the node resource. Command strings can reference this data and thus avoid hard coding node or environment specific values. Uh, so a note about commands, the default node executor for the local Rundeck server uh, node is uh, sh. So it's, you know, slash bin slash sh. So anything that you're going to be running there is going to be run through a shell. So just like you were, you know, on a command line prompt uh, with, with the shell, it's, it's just going to be run, uh, which means uh, that you're simply going to type into the command field what you would like to be ran in order to execute it on the node, right? This is going to be typically one-off commands or status retrieving commands, nothing. You're not going to do anything fancy here. Um, however, this is format in the same style as job steps, what we had briefly touched on earlier. Um, so they can also use any of the same tricks that you use on those job step steps. So like we, we use the export to export variables and then like build up a variable string after a bunch of inline if statements and then come to an actual um, exec uh, execution. So execution, like an actual playbook yeah. execution or a, a Python script execution and then pass the arguments there. Uh, you can do pipes, you can do subshells, you can do evaluations, you know, anything that you can do in in a shell, you can do in that command prompt there. So feel free to whip out your CLI foo and and craft something that's going to do exactly like you want it to. However, the 
temptation is always, all right, if this is going to be something I run once off and I'm going to put all this effort and energy into it, is there a possibility that I'm going to run it in the future? And if so, wouldn't it just be better to be ran as a job? Right. It, would it, would right. it, wouldn't it be right. better for me to spend, you know, the five minutes creating a job, setting this up so that I can run it over and over again? Um, so something to think about. Keep in mind that the activity does hold the history of commands as well. So if you do need to rerun a command, you can find it in the activity as long as you're not, you know, wiping it out. Um, well, the one thing I can think of for executions and this would be a very odd one is that if uh ssh access isn't granted for users but it's granted via the run deck interface so essentially if you need to run a command and it's not a job basically you just want to i'm trying to think of a good example like df you know just want to check the space on the on a server now i don't know why you would not let s some users shell in you know what fine don't let application developers shell in just let them run it from the from run deck where it's auditable right you can see who's running what commands on what servers yep and then allowing them to just run whatever commands that you know you can run whatever command you want on your app server but you're gonna have to run it through run deck we're not gonna let you and whoever and you're gonna be running it sign right on specific user with a specific right. connection so right that can that can also kind of whittle away at the potential for abuse there totally with all of that i did want to jump into monitoring here i totally just went to the what is it google's sre book and the chapter on monitoring and i've read the book before and one of my favorite parts is that they describe monitoring as the base that base level of they kind of match it to maslow's hierarchy of needs and they put, mon so they kind of create their own or whatever, and they put monitoring at the bottom. And I thought to myself, okay, a monitoring is great. What is it? Why do I need to do this? Am I going to sit and look at a dashboard all day? Do I need to get alerted for this? How are, how are alerts going to work? What do I need to get alerted on? I was thinking about this at work. I was thinking about this just in a home, like you have your home lab environment. I've been thinking, I wonder if he has a dashboard that he just pulls up and he's like, oh yeah. I've got this stuff going wrong. Uh, it looks like, you know, 80 million different pings and people trying to pen test me and my home network. What does this look like? Do I Am I even aware of it, right? And those questions started coming to mind. I started thinking about it. I'm like, okay, let me do it. Uh, let me look into logging, monitoring, all of this fun stuff for a little bit and see what I can come up with. Um, So I have all these great notes here. You can check them out. You, I'm really just going to link the page to the uh, SRE book, but essentially what it boiled down to, uh, what I took away, there were kind of a handful of main points, uh, what monitoring is. So I'm just going to read the, the freaking definition here. Uh, collecting, processing, aggregating, and displaying. I don't like that displaying word. Real-time quantitative data about a system, such as query counts and types, error counts and types, processing times and server lifetimes fine that's all great i love all of that i don't know about displaying if that should be included in the definition of monitoring i, I who sits what at, what in this in the rest of your notes here uh would would indicate that mon or displaying may not be worth being in that definition i and this is what i think of when you say display that means it's up on a board, right? People are looking at it. Maybe it's a knock. Maybe it's sock. Maybe, you know, maybe who, whoever it is, is looking at a board, just watching their computer. And they're looking at dashboards saying, all right, well, it looks like we're starting to have errors on X or Y service. Like, okay, that's great. We didn't need you to sit here and watch a dashboard. We could have made a smart metric to say, all right, ping whoever, ping the application owner when there's an issue starting to happen or when we see issues starting to happen. And that's what I don't like about that display word. Collecting, great. Processing, yes. I think all the data has to be processed, right? Aggregating, it's got to be in one place. If you're looking at a snapshot of a knock, I would agree. 
I would I, I would it, I would say yes if if you're smart enough to have a green light turn red when something happens, you're smart enough to have an alert sent about that light to having turned whoever, red. Exactly right. Yeah. Now there is obviously the one extra piece of you know especially in that kind of environment it is up there for everyone to see whereas you never know if someone's going to be checking their email that exact moment um the other thing is as you are dealing with outages um outages that you may even not have been aware of before like outages that you haven't seen before outages that you know errors that that you hadn't run into before right you can start looking at and this is you know you could display things intelligently you can display things in a historic type manner you can see oh it looks like every day around midnight we dumped a whole bunch of ram for no good reason and then it started creeping up again right and it could have been that the process was restarting itself over and over and that's not something that that you caught before but in displaying though that data about the system you can start to to see a, a pattern rather than me having to go through sar data and collect Look a whole bunch and, of yeah 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 stuff about you know what was the ram and put it into a graph manually let's let's be preemptive and and get our own graphs have it there and that's what you think the yeah. benefit of having that display part is you're able to look at it cyclically and be like, all right, well, this happened last night at midnight and it looks like it happened today. There was a spike again today at midnight. Now I can cyclically start to visualize is, that. Is is definitely a way that you can look at it. Also, you know, you can't alert on stuff that you don't know about yet. Well, and that's a great point, but how are you going to monitor on that, right? What does that look like? You can't, For right? instance, for instance, right? If we know that there is a possibility that a socket, like the commands receivable socket, could go down, um, we would be monitoring that socket, right? Okay. Because that's that's a potential right. for failure, right? That's right. a that's a right. failure point, right? So if it's if it's up, then we're green. If it's down, then we're red, right? The what we're doing there is we're we're identifying a root cause which could exhibit itself in a number of symptoms. Okay. Right. And that, that is an intelligent uh, thing to, thing to track. Right. It's probably not going to be something I display. Right. But if I see sure. that something's going all wonky and that I got an alert about the socket. the socket going down, right. Then I can say, let's fix the socket first and then see if that brings everything it's back to normal. Still going. If it doesn't bring everything back to normal, then we say, okay, something's, we something's really got off. a problem now. Yeah. 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 Maybe like while it was running, you know, one of the bind mount points got double mounted or, you know, something. Yeah. yeah something. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't know. Um, but, but having that, having that data in there, um, especially just symptomatic data, just like something, something, something's weird about this, and and that's a lot of RAM, CPU, disk, you know, the the basics. But you can you can see a hey, that's returned to normal. Now you can say, all right, well, sure, but why not just put like an AI on it so it can establish a baseline and then sure, tell you sure. when it's gone back to normal, and. And and at that point, I just throw my hands up and walk out of the room because I'm like, how much money and time do you think we have? And, you know, development power. I mean, we only have so much. It's it's a lot simpler to put stuff on a freaking graph and go look at it than to develop then, an artificial intelligence to do analysis. To monitor it. Right. <laughs> the AI. Well, we didn't think it was broken. <laughs> it didn't look that broken. <laughs> but that brings it to a great point, though. And that's the... Uh, You've been talking a lot about the symptom versus the cause, right? And that's something they mentioned in the book or in that chapter, I should say, is, all right, what's the symptom? It's like, we're getting 500s. Okay, that's great. Your web app isn't working. It's That's just a symptom, right, of the problem. The cause could be, well, our database crashed or we ran out of disk, we ran out of disk space. So it's like, why can't I, I, the error, I can't upload anything else to NextCloud. What's going on? Oh, it looks like block storage is completely filled on the instance. That's that would be the cause. So they did mention a lot of that, um, and then they went into 
some benefits of monitoring and the four golden they put their four golden signals out there i absolutely i i don't know what you think on these four signals i love them i'm gonna read them out here just so everyone's aware okay. of them yeah uh yeah. latency uh the time it takes a service to service a request traffic is a measure of how much demand is being placed on a system measured in high level system specific like a system specific metric uh errors which is the rate of requests that fail, either explicitly, implicitly, or by policy. This could mean, you know, we want to serve requests at the rate of, I'm going to make up something dumb, don't ju don't judge it. One, We're going to serve one per second. We're going to serve one request per second. That's sure. terrible, absolutely terrible. But, you know, if it, say you're serving one request per every two seconds, well, that's an error, right? That's showing up as an error. And then the last one here, saturation, how full your service is. And this one... This one kind of, when when I think of this one, it, me, it immediately drives me down to physical. Like how much RAM are we using, right? How much is the JVM using? That I I think I go to Java apps, but how much is how much RAM is the JVM using? Is it you know because those things can just get blown out of proportion, right? And it, it, what's what's why is there saturation? Is it requests not being fulfilled? Is there something else going on? But those are the four. I like all of them. Now, I think monitoring for all of them is difficult. I think I, I'm kind of like a, it reminds me of the triangle. Uh, what is it? Fast, good, and cheap. Or, you know, so it's like pick pick two and you're going to struggle on the other. It's like, well, here are four, pick two. <laughs> That's kind of what I think. So I immediately jump to errors, right? Yeah. And then I jump to usually traffic isn't a big one but i do like latency right because that's that's what people notice how fast is this thing coming to me how, how am i how, how is this getting delivered is, you know do i have to wait do i have to sit here and actually watch the page load and i have had that on some portal page you know when i'm trying to load three megs of javascript across the uh internet on my local host i'm just like what is going on i'm like oh i'm trying to bring in every dependency and its mother on a single page I would say probably the two easiest to get started with, however, are going to be errors and saturation because it's really easy to test for an error and it's really easy to test for Unix metrics because we've been doing that forever. Totally. Right. But traffic is going to be system specific, as it says here, and and latency is going to be as well it's going to it's going to require more complex infrastructure testing infrastructure to be set up for that um, as well as more intelligent tests and and evaluation of those tests especially in terms of monitoring too yeah but right setting it, it i agree setting it up is can be difficult, but nginx I, I feel like does provide a pretty good job with our logs those can be analyzed now that's not real time per se that's a, i think a different story um well and i would and say I it's not monitoring right it's it's logging you you can it, go back and look correct. at logs and you can say all right well this is what it was for the past week but monitoring gives you that real time right yep we get alert we get disk alerts from DigitalOcean, which i think are great right we get hey the socket's broken right now we're gonna auto try and run an auto fix that's great i i would call that i would call those monitoring i would not call us going back and looking at Hey, you know, how long did it take this page to load for portal or how long does it take command center front page to load? Yeah, Cause I, I have can, gone in and looked at I that, can, but it's not real time. I, I was, I was just thinking, yeah, I can, I can track the socket now to see if it, if it falls over, we can do a restart of it because what I've been doing with the reboot thing, but that's next episode. We can, we can talk about that next episode. Yeah. What do you, what are you wrapping up here with, with monitoring? The one thing I wanted to wrap up with, uh, and I love it, it's from them as well. It's uh, piling requirements on top of each other <laughs> can add up to a very mm. complex system, right? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't hear that. Can you say that one more time? <laughs> piling <laughs> requirements on top of each other can add up to a very complex system. Reach so, it. <laughs> Uh, and I love that they include this for mo for monitoring, right? For a monitoring solution. Yeah. And you don't even think about it. You just think, all right, well, I'm supposed to get the alert when this happens or, you know, 
these are these if this criteria is met, um, this is supposed to happen. Whatever. And you then, don't think about you know, it. You have an a- incident, and then you have that feedback loop where someone gets blamed for the incident, and they're they they turn around and say, "Well, if only that had been monitored." And yeah, right. Then you right. get a task out of that, saying, "How did this become my fault?" Yes, exactly. So that was the one thing I wanted to end on. It's like. Like all software systems, monitoring can become so complex that it's fragile. And this is what I also want to get back to, was that, think about it now, we have Docker monitoring, right? We have health checks that run milliseconds, seconds, run every five seconds. We have it now that it used to be, it would just run compositional role on everything, the entire instance, and it would just kind of blow it away for three to five minutes. But now we're kind of moving into that stage where it's, Hey, portal saying that one service went bad, right? You know, maybe one service is having issues. Maybe a run deck is having issues. Now, instead of blowing away the entire instance for three to five minutes, killing whoever is on there, now we're just able to say, hey, look, this is isolated. We don't have to run it on our entire instance. We can just run it against the one service. And so I'm excited to see what we have coming for going forward. But that was really uh, kind of where I wanted to bring it home was with the uh, movement towards 4.0 and just being able to restart basically one service at a time now. Yeah, no, you you hit the, the nail right on the head there. I mean, that is that is the way that we serve the people who are actually using the product. And, and also, that's me. I'm, I'm using it too, so I'm serving. It's self-serving if you really want to, you know, straw man me. But... Yeah, the 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 uh, efficiencies that that continue to to come out here, right? The the way this continues to get better, the way we you know are able to to integrate feedback and 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 keep polishing this product, um, are are things that we are committed to, right? And and that we're we're gonna keep doing. I mean, this this allows me and and you know we didn't really touch on it in in monitoring, but I mean, the end point of monitoring is that I don't have to look at a display and and that's also where right. you get your hang up there too right i can go out and i can have my day at the park you know if i want i can have my lazy sunday i can go play frisbee golf right and and not have to worry uh, about stuff like this right so so that's the ecosystem that we're looking to provide and if if uh anyone out there is is looking for that too if you're looking for that kind of peace of mind if you're looking for that hey i just need stuff that works uh, hop aboard the train. I mean, we're we're going full steam ahead here. Um, go to rcompose.com, right? Sign up, sign up for the mailing list. You're you're gonna ha- see a lot of a lot of big things coming down the pipe there. Um, so super excited for that, and uh, and and everything that we we've really already done. Um, and and uh, yeah, don't don't be late. Don't don't snooze on this. Don't sleep on this. Anyways, my rambling aside, we hope you enjoyed this episode of our Composed Cast. Thank you. Be safe. And we'll see you all in two weeks. Bye, everybody.